sample. Uh, sample is an, an automated self-driving lab system that we've put together for protein engineering. We tried to make it as general as possible, sort of uh, so people can plug and play with different libraries and different assays. And uh, let's get into this. So first off, what does it mean when we say that something is automated? Uh, there are a bunch of different levels of automation. Uh, these are the terms for them. You'll see this sort of uh, framing when you talk about self-driving cars a lot. Uh, but conveniently, uh, this uh, review authored by Hector Garcia Martin applied it to uh, a biological context just this year. So ideally, you want to have uh, higher levels of autonomy for uh, in, in order to reduce the need for humans in your uh, in the, the less interesting parts of the research. The way I like to think of this is that we're not making humans redundant. We're replacing the boring parts so that you can focus on the interesting bits of uh, doing your engineering work. And so traditional self-driving laboratory systems, like I'll show you a couple of uh, on the next slide, or I, let me go back. I, I mis misspoke a bit. The, the uh, conception of a self-driving lab out of this particular review would only be this conditional autonomy level. That is where humans are telling it what to do and then it executes it and then it waits for a new instruction. It, you tell it what to do and it executes it. It's, it's, a he it's a somewhat automated system, but we can do better than that. Uh, what they reference at, at level four here is a paper some of you may have seen before, this uh, The Automation of Science, big paper out of 2009. They made this robot called Adam. It had a... Um, directed graph model of all of yeast metabolism and a whole bunch of orphan genes. And it was tasked with finding out which uh, metabolites were corresponding to those orphan genes. And so it was just a supplementation and see, is it upstream or downstream of this knockout? And so it would basically do a binary search through this directed graph uh, in that way. And that was really cool, but it required this incredibly detailed uh, metabolic model that if it were wrong in any way would make this um, this method incapable of reaching conclusions. And so we wanted to take this uh, a step further and see what do we do if we don't even start with a model? That's, that's what sample does. And so this fully automated case where you say, here is a task. Here's the kind of experiment you can do, and here's some variables you can tweak. Uh, come back to me with a result after you've done, say, 10 or 100 cycles. That, thing, that sort of process hasn't really been done in biology. It has been done in materials chemistry. And so we took a little bit of inspiration from there. Um, both of these, both of these uh, papers that I reference here are from um, thin film uh, uh, research projects. And so, you know, they have a very quick assay. What are the optical properties when you shine a light at this film? They have a very quick prototyping step where they're depositing uh, metals and ions onto a, a surface with lasers. And so you can do these very quick uh, repetitive cycles and learn each time. Now, obviously, bio biology is going to be a lot slower than 10 second iterations or 20 minute iterations. But this gives us a framework to work with, and we can get a lot faster than the typical like week-long process of cloning in a new gene, transforming cells, extracting protein, et cetera. And so here's how we go about that. This is SAMPLE. SAMPLE stands for Self-Driving Autonomous Machines for Protein Landscape Exploration. Uh, we have an agent that is purely software, and we have this uh, environment, which is a robotic experimenter. Uh, when we were initially starting this project out, the environment was a TCAN uh, liquid handling robot. And at the current stage of this project, uh, we work with Stratios Cloud Labs. And so their robot is our environment. And it works exactly the same regardless because the agent and the environment are disconnected except for the data they pass between each other. So the job of the agent is to use what it knows and put together a Gaussian process model of the uh, fitness of uh, the sequence to function landscape. And then based on some rules that it, it has uh, built into it, score every member of the library based on that uh, landscape model and choose a sequence to test. And then it passes that information to the 
experimental side, which will synthesize the gene, express the protein, uh, and then perform an assay for really whatever particular, um, um, sorry, whatever function of interest you're looking at. In our case, we're looking at thermal stability, but it could be just about anything. It could be protein activity. It could be uh, optimal pH for activity. There, there's all that really matters for sample is that the environment, the experimental side brings back a number or some sort of measurement of what worked. The agent doesn't actually know what's being measured. It just knows that if it submits this sequence, it gets back 49. If it sends back that sequence, it gets inactive. That's all that the environment is from the perspective of the AI. And then there's a, a few data quality uh, filtering steps where we make sure that we're not getting false negatives and we try to avoid false positives as well. You update the database, you now have a different uh, sequence function model and the cycle continues. Every time you run through this cycle, you add more data to your sequence function model and it gives you different uh, choices. And so now we're gonna focus a little bit on just the left side here. Well, how does this AI work? What, it, what are its goals? How does it function? So we frame protein engineering in this uh, context as a Bayesian optimization problem. So with a, I, I like to draw a distinction between what I call center out engineering approaches and top down engineering approaches. Uh, you think about directed evolution, you start with some protein sequence and then you make a whole bunch of double mutants or triple mutants and then you see what does better. And then you use that as the seed for your next step. That's a very simplified idea of it, but you, you get what I'm saying here. That's a, a center out approach. It makes smallish steps along this landscape in a generally upward direction. A global, a top down method instead uh, samples areas until it's convinced that they are not that active and it will focus in areas that are higher activity uh, it doesn't rely on the uh, the sequences that will be more active being close in the sequence space to what you've already got. So when you think of, of proteins in general as a massive multiple sequence alignment, you can see there's 21 to the n possible sequences, which is absolutely absurd. We need a, uh, a quick approach. Direct evolution uh, does a good job of that by doing a huge number of experiments in a localized area. We instead do a small number of experiments scattered across this landscape. And the way we do that is by the UCB algorithm. That's upper confidence bound. Upper confidence bound is the is just at the upper, upper end of the 95 confidence interval on a point. We start here with a completely untrained Gaussian process model. This is just a one dimensional toy example. Uh, and so when you start out, you have a prior that just says, we don't know anything. So we're just going to assume everything zero plus or minus 10 in this little one dimensional toy example. And then we add a couple of observations. This would represent a few known sequences in this space. And now we have a little bit of an understanding, but it's not that much. And so now the upper confidence bound part of this algorithm comes into play, which is we're just going to select whatever has the highest upper confidence bound. That's the sequence that could be the best. Uh, there are mathematical proofs about this uh, minimizing regret, which in this case would be experiments that don't get, take us in a positive direction. But the, the process you can see as we continue to uh, sample these areas with the high upper confidence bound, we focus our searching in this, this upper region of the sequence space. And we don't really care about those low regions because unless we're very wrong in our model, such that the 95, such that the true function isn't within the 95% confidence interval, then there's nothing of value there compared to what we're finding by searching the top of this space. And so you can see in this case, we did find the region that constitutes this top of the curve. But there's a problem with UCB for proteins. And that problem is that not all proteins are active. That algorithm depends on having a smooth, continuous function mapping your input to your output. And if you don't have continuity, then we run into a bit of an issue. Because if you're sampling, let's say right here in this big gap, and you don't get any result, well, then you don't have something to update your model with. 
And so your model is the same, except now you're just not going to select that point. And so you're going to select whatever's next to it. And you, you just file down the top of that bubble until you get a different observation. Not ideal. And in fact, it's worse than random if you don't address this problem. So uh, we tried a few, a couple of ways to address this. Uh, you can see in this left curve here, the green line is random. The uh, orange line is if you take UCB and you don't um, do something for it. And so within 60 sequences tested, you, you, you perform worse than random at finding these high performing sequences. We address this by adding a classifier to this mix. So now we have this Gaussian process regressor and a Gaussian process classifier working together. The regressor is giving us that mean and the uh, uncertainty that, that went into the UCB animation earlier. And the classifier is just for base for every sequence, estimating whether it is more likely to be uh, active or inactive. It gives a, a number from zero to one for all of these sequences. UCB positive is we just take a 50% cutoff and only sequences that are above that get to be considered in our UCB selection process. It's fine, it's, it clearly does pretty well, but it's a little crude for my taste because that 0.5 is kind of arbitrary. And so instead we use this expected UCB where instead of, of just having a cutoff, we multiply. So we take all of the, teeth, all of the, the mean and uncertainty predictions, we sort of slide that window down so that it starts at zero, just because it makes the multiplication a little bit simpler a little bit more consistent, I should say. And then we take every sequence's upper confidence bound with that, you know, that shift towards zero and multiply it by the probability that that sequence will be active. And so that gives us our expected UCB. I will refer to it as EUCB through the rest of this talk score. Um, you, if you look at the histograms to the right here, it looks, it seems that both UCB positive and expected UCB have a, very similar medians to the time it takes for them to reach 90% of the maximum thermal stability in this uh, data set that we are using. Uh, this, this, these are simulated experiments on a uh, data set from a previous uh, paper uh, that did uh, P450s, chimeric P450s. Uh, speaking of chimeras, this is the search space that we defined. Um, we wanted to um, we wanted to minimize the amount of different solutions we needed in order to uh, get our big search space. So chimeras were a great fit. Additionally, when you uh, are using chimeric proteins, you're effectively putting bounds in overall sequence space. And so now all of the um, all of the possible sequences you can look at are sort of within this convex space. Uh, that you've defined by these corners that are your parental sequences. We take six naturally occurring uh, beta-glucosidases from Streptomyces species. These were just gotten through, I believe, a jackhammer search. We just had a, uh, I think, 70% identity cutoff where it had to be below 70% identity. And then we added some additional fragments that we designed later. Uh, for the Rosetta design fragments, we just took a chunk of the protein fixed the rest of it and then let all of the different residues uh, vary between any residues that were present among the six uh, parents. And then evolution design, we just took a consensus sequence of this whole family of proteins and just said of this residues which are represented among our parents at this position, which one is most present in this MSA. And so it's, it's not a true uh, consensus sequence, but making it a true consensus sequence would uh, mean we'd have to encode our sequences a little bit more thoroughly. We just did a very simple one-hot encoding for those of you who care about that bit. So now we've got our search space, we've got our algorithm. What? Let's put a little bit more emphasis on what specifically is happening on the robot to close this loop so that I can step out of the loop. Because at this point, you know, we're still developing things. I have to be involved. I don't want to be involved. I'm an automation guy. I, I want to be lazy. And so here's just a bit more detail about what's happening in this experimental step. We have that chimeric library where every sequence in it, of which there are 1,352, every sequence can be assembled from no more than four uh, DNA fragments. 
You take those four fragments, put them in a well, do a Golden Gate assembly, you get your linear DNA. PCR gives you a bunch of linear DNA, and then we drop that into a cell-free expression mix, which gives us protein after about three hours. And then we do a biochemical characterization where we take that, that uh, protein we've expressed, we dilute it a bit, and then we heat it at a, a series of different temperatures. We just heat different aliquots at different temperatures in for 10 minute intervals. And then we take that all back and put it onto a fluorogenic substrate and see how active is the protein um, over time. And that gives us a curve sort of like what you see on the right here. Um, somewhat annoyingly, the expression mix that we use has a beta glucosidase activity. So we have that bit of shoulder that you see it on the, the bottom right of the curve there. But uh, our proteins are sufficiently active that we can more we can generally uh, eliminate the effect of that shoulder when it comes to actually fitting a T50 to our data. Additionally, we have a checkpoint in the middle of this process uh, because we really care about avoiding false negatives and false positives to the extent possible. And what this checkpoint says is, if we take this PCR product and add it to uh, Eva Green, which is very similar to Cyber Green for those not familiar with Eva Green. Um, if in the presence of double-stranded DNA, it fluoresces. And so if we get a lot of fluorescence, PCR was successful, which means Golden Gate was necessarily also successful. And if we don't get a lot of uh, fluorescence, then we ignore the result we get out of the assay because it wasn't based on protein that we expressed. Or at the very least, it wasn't based on the DNA that we intended to put in there. So now we've got all the pieces. We've got our AI, we've got our uh, robotic pipeline, and we've got our, our library. Put that all together, and then it's just a question of press go and let the robot learn. We wanted to, to uh, demonstrate reproducibility here, and so in order to do that, we set up four independent example instances of sample. Uh, we did three rounds on uh, Stratios's robots to generate uh, data for the parental sequences with a little bit of experimental noise built in, uh, just sort of naturally. And then we randomly assigned uh, those three uh, values for each parent to four different sample agents. So each one is starting with six data points that vary slightly, except for parent four. Parent four always just has a value of dead, which we didn't know it was inactive when we added it to this uh, library, but it ended up being interesting. So, oh, sorry. We have this, this, this is part of our, uh, our checking method for preventing false positives and false negatives, where um, in order for an enzyme to be labeled active and get a thermal stability value, it has to be significantly more active than the background. We uh, we've set a two to one ratio, but we could have easily set a different one if we wanted to be more or less stringent. And then in order for something to be labeled inactive, because sometimes protein expression just doesn't work, especially in an in, re in vitro mix, uh, we required it to be observed inactive twice. And additionally, there are a couple of other uh, sort of software side issues that if they happen, it can't be labeled act uh, inactive. It just gets retried. Anyway. Onto the actual results. The meat of this, what you're here for. The four agents started with data for the, for the six parents, and then we just let them go. In the first round, their choices were very similar, and uh, they very rapidly diverged. Uh, a, a huge amount of what you'll see here is, is um, randomness driving this. Uh, there were a couple of very interesting results along the way. Uh, agent one made a mistake in round 10. Agent three also made a mistake in round five, but it was less impactful overall. Um, so agent one mistakenly labeled the shoulder of that uh, curve as an active sequence, which was a problem because now we have an inactive sequence that is actually being labeled as the most active this, se this agent has ever seen. And it did uh, strongly affect the uh, choices that the agent made in the subsequent few rounds. So you can see in round 12, it had this incredibly low observation. 
it thought that that was going to be very similar to the one that was mislabeled. Uh, Agent two didn't observe anything active until round eight, and then fairly rapidly, because its classifier was so well trained, was able to find some high performers. Uh, Agent three got lucky right at the start. And you can see from this bottom bit here, this is just a uh, multidimensional scaling of, a, the, of our library with some smoothing so that colors are a little bit less obnoxious. Um, and you can see that this, the path that they, they took through this space was wildly different from agent to agent. To the, in fact, agent four never even looked at that sort of local maximum. It just focused in hard on the global maximum. Um, we were curious now, now that we have the data, we have the results, every agent has given us its, its favorite uh, enzyme. We wanted to see how did it get to that point. And so these were the T50 predictions for every sequence in each in, in the library as each agent saw them. And the, the real interesting thing I want to focus on here is uh, positions like this, where you have a huge amount of crossovers. Anytime you see steep lines on these traces, that means that the agent changed its mind significantly about a bunch of different things at once. Agent two changed its mind here about the scale of the model. Prior to that, it had been taking a very narrow scope of what T50s were reasonable. And then as soon as it observed something high, it, it ballooned out in both directions. Uh, but the, the big one to focus on is the, the crossover in agent one, where the mistake radically altered its uh, understanding of the landscape. And over time, there were a few other crossovers that gradually brought it back to thinking that the high performers would in fact be high performers. Uh, we, we took all of the data from the end of this process, pooled it together, and said, uh, as the learning progressed, how well did each agent's predictions match with the, what we call the unified model, where we just put, pooled all the data, fit a GPR to it, and called that truth. And so as you would expect, as time goes on, they all of the agents get more in line with the uh, predictions based, the predictions of the model. But uh, it's interesting to see how um, agent three got up there pretty quickly. And I, that's based on that uh, really lucky uh, observation in uh, rounds three and four. And you, you see the agent four had zero correlation for a while, which I thought was rather amusing. Uh, if you look at each agent's cross uh, correlation with each other, uh, they all have this general trend of downward correlation at first and then a bit more upward at the end. Um, which is somewhat to be expected when they start out with the same data. So they should have, or not the same, but very similar data. So they should all start in roughly the same uh, predictions. And then as they have, they, they get observations and they learn, but the observations are completely different from one agent to another. And so it's not terribly surprising that you would have the correlation between their predictions drop before coming back up as they start to have enough observations to have a more complete model. And then at the end of all of this, we wanted to to validate, you know, we have this, um, each agent gave us its preferred sequence, what it believes is the best one in the set. That one in all cases was at least 12 degrees stronger than the best parental sequence in the library. And so I went back in by hand, you know, cloned all these into expression plasmids, purified proteins, just to confirm that it was in fact significant improvements. Um, as you can see here that the T50s were in fact significantly improved, not necessarily by 12 degrees, probably owing to different assay conditions uh, because I can't precisely replicate the uh, Bionier mix in lysate. And then uh, we also did kinetic assay just to see these uh, improved enzymes that we've uh, come up with, are they uh, more active, less active? Because we didn't select for activity. But the fact that we did screen out inactive proteins does mean that we are 
sort of implicitly selecting against low activity, if that makes sense. Happy to clarify more uh, in questions if people like. But anyway, the big takeaway from this was all of these were significantly more uh, thermal stable than the best parent in the library, and they were all at least as kinetically active as the uh, best parent in the library. So conclusions here, your takeaways, kind of blazed through this thing, but hopefully we'll have a lengthy question session. Uh, sample is able to search protein libraries for these high activity variants without any need for human intervention or uh, prior data. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this thing did not have any pre-built model. No literature data went into this, just the uh, seed data from the chimeric parents. And uh, it does not need to understand the nature of what's being optimized. If you were to look at the uh, the data files that the AI is actually using, it doesn't know that it's it's reading T50s. It just knows that it has a number or the word dead or the word retry. And that could easily be for any other sort of output as well. And finally, sample is robust to errors given sufficient time. I talked a lot about the error that it made in agent one and how it made bad predictions for a while. But what I didn't emphasize at the time was that it did find a high performer in the end. It found two of them. And that's uh, real exciting. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all my lab. Um, this is a very old picture. I chose it because it still includes my, my uh, partner on this project who left us three years ago. And um, with that, I uh, would please give me questions. I went too fast. Thank you so much, Jacob. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give everybody a chance to what well, questions in the chat. We can also have you unmute if you're interested, but I'll go ahead and start reading some of the questions that we had in the chat so far. Um, so the first question is from Marshall, um, and he asked on slide 13, what was your clustering approach and dimensionality reduction process? So uh, on that one, I I don't remember because I didn't actually generate this figure. Phil, Phil made this one and he refuses to give me his code. Um, what I do know is that he uh, applied a smoothing factor where every every point is colored not necessarily based on its own T50, but by the greatest T50 within a certain radius. Um, as, as for uh, clustering method, all of the sequences were one hot encoded and that's the data that was fed into the MDS. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. MDS is not a specialty of mine. Okay. I know it's it's, uh, it's like a set from our external machine learning for proteins here. Okay. okay. I just ask that you uh, unmute only if you're going to ask a question at the time. Oh, I'm gonna, muting everything else. Doing the last the step. They have transformed. But we can go through. I like. I don't. Yeah. It's okay. I realize that shadowing me is not the best way to learn it because, like, I was trying to go fast. Time, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to go fast. And like... Okay. The second question that we have today. Um, Given that each agent learned its own view of the landscape, have you tried continuing running the agents as an ensemble? So we could have done that. The reason that we didn't decide to was that um, uh, each of these runs is expensive and we had run out of materials and figured at this point, let's just stop. Uh, if we were to continue running as an ensemble, I think the behavior would be very similar to the later half of Agent 3, where it knows what defines this sort of high performing region but it's run out of things to test that fit that hype, that specific formula. And so it would continue s sampling more broadly outside of that region, if that, if that makes sense. Awesome. And by the way, if any of the two previous questions want more clarifications, uh, please feel free to like put that in the chat for us. Um, but I will be moving on to the next question. Is there a way to optimize the construction of the chimeric parents based upon natural sequences? What was the diversity of the chimeras to start with? 
Yes. So uh, I mentioned that when we were searching for parents, uh, it was, I believe, a 70% sequence identity cutoff. Um, we just started from uh, the uh, beta glucosidase light labeled BGL3. And we started from that one purely because it had a crystal structure, which is a uh, which is used in the schema RASP algorithm. Schema RASP is what we used to define the breakpoints in this uh, chimeric library. It tries to maximize the number of um, mutations between fragments while also minimizing how many um, close contacts you break. So I'm sorry, I lost the original question. What was it again, Meg? Yeah, is there a way to optimize the construction of the chimeric parents based upon natural sequences? And what was like the diversity of your chimeras that you started with? Yes, okay. So uh, we did look at uh, the, we, we looked at the uh, like average diversity between these different chimeras. And uh, on average, a uh, median, any two chimeras differed by, I believe it was 116 residues. Uh, let me, I can't, I can't pull up the PDF without closing this window. Um, any, anyway, it was by quite a bit. Yeah, actually I can, I can do it. I can check this. It's going to be a bit crude. Let, uh, forgive. I have the sort of rest of the figure. There we are. There, there's the uh, pairwise Hamming distance and the distribution of the diversity around this uh, crystal structure. So uh, in terms of like optimizing construction based on natural sequences, that's kind of what was done here in that we found natural sequences that we could then make this diverse library between. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and I think you also, I just know this because I know this research a little well, but I think you've also touched on like the autoencoder as well, like in comparing between natural sequences. Um, maybe you didn't touch on that today on this talk, but um, the next question was about when the paper will be released on BioArchive. So maybe uh, to further answer the previous question, that might be something that you might see in the BioArchives. So, uh, yes, Jacob, do you have a BioArchives link for us right now, or did it just go to BioArchives this morning? I can't remember. Uh, we don't have a date yet. Um, uh, our current position is that we're going to submit this to BioArchive as soon as it goes out to reviewers from the journal that we've submitted it to, which should not be terribly long. Uh, I will pass along a link to Meg as soon as it is available. And we will update um, on the Slack as well as our website, just like always with any updated uh, links for papers or preprints. Okay, so the next question was, how do you envision applying this um, to something that is about activity level slash specificity rather than thermostability, since that's what you kind of looked at with your proteins? Right, so sort of the, the key there is this system only really knows sequences and uh, assay. The assay is what you're going to change. Your sequence library is what will change. Everything else can stay the same between different uh, con uh, conceptualizations of this system. So if you were to look at, as at uh, activity, the biggest difference is that you would now have to uh, normalize for protein loading. Thermal stability is nice because it's self-normalizing. You know, if you have 100 units of activity, your T50 is at 50 units. If you have 10 units of activity, your T50 is at five. You don't get that privilege when you're working with uh, something like activity or even uh, with binding. But if we were to do, say, a GFP fusion or something similar where we can now control the amount of protein that's present and either in the case of activity, normalize to the protein loading or in the case of, of um of binding selectively dilute the protein to the level that we need for a consistent loading. Other than that, nothing else here really needs to be changed. You just have to have some sort of assay that can be that can pass the data back to the AI. 
Awesome. The next question that we had in the chat was, could you elaborate on the size of the search space and the likelihood of your agents to fail at, at convergence? Yes. Uh, so the size of our search space is defined, is defined by the library that we're working from. So because I've got to change the cropping again, patience. OK. So the size of our search space in this case is defined by what fragments we have access to and where they have these crossover points. So if you were to just have the green fragments, you'd have a search space of 1,296 sequences. Uh, adding the others, because they have weird and unusual breakpoints, uh, doesn't actually add that much. It takes you from 1,296 to 1,352. Um, but you could very easily add another parent or add a, uh, additional breakpoints, and you'd rapidly expand the scope of your search space. And uh, what was the second part of that question, Meg? Um, basically, when you're in your sequence space and you have a convergence, what is like the likelihood that these agents might fail at convergence? I see. And so that would really come to what we showed here. This is, again, uh, results on simulated data. But you can you can sort of think of this as a you know if we give it fifty rounds to search, you can look at the the integral of that curve and sort of say how likely is it that we have reached our goal and how likely is it we have not reached our goal by that endpoint. Uh, there are actually two main strategies for ending a project like this. Uh, we used fixed budget where you have a fixed number of of experiments you're allowed to run. That's the simpler implementation. There is a more complex one called uh, fixed confidence, which is you basically keep running until you have a certain confidence that you have reached a particular threshold, whether it's like 90% of max or 95% of max. And that one will generally run longer because you need to be more confident that the rest of the space doesn't have what you're looking for. But uh, basically, I can't necessarily answer what the likelihood is of not finding a result, but I feel like it would be more certain that you would get a result with the fixed confidence approach, which is much more difficult to implement. Awesome. Uh, the next question that I have here is, what is the criteria being used to learn and discriminate based upon fitness without a prior model of the overall fitness landscape? Yes. So um, going back to this little, little flow chart here, um, because we don't know what the fitness landscape, we don't know the scope of anything, but we do have the parents and we do have a sort of a lower bound on thermal stability that is set by the fact that our protein expression happens at 30 Celsius. So we know that the, the peak thermal stability here is going to be somewhere above 30. And we know that it's going to be, we, we hope that it's, we ex expect, I should say, that it's going to be below 80. And so that's the range that we uh, looked within. And those are just sort of built-in constraints on this sort of system. Um, as for, sorry, I, I, let me just pull up the text of the question so I can look at it. And so most of these, uh, these things that would determine like whether a protein is active or not are uh, much more empirical. It's just, we have this background activity, that background activity is a problem. And so when we're fitting this double logistic curve, we need to have a certain, um, a certain scale of activity from our protein of interest in order to be confident that we're not mixing it up with the background activity. And so that's, that's not something that it's looking at the broader fitness landscape for. That's more looking at within the context of this assay that we are doing, can we get a value out of it with confidence? I think, I think that answers the question. Please tell me if not. Yes, please follow up, Avik, if uh, you want more information on that. Um, for now, I'll move on to the next question that was asked by Nathaniel. 
are runs expensive primarily due to time, assay cost, or robotics? Do you think that you could explore more diverse sequence spaces if models could crosstalk uh, meta learning or transfer learning? So I feel like that's two questions. So maybe first address uh, what's most expensive in this process and then more um, about the models crosstalking. All right. So uh, in terms of cost, it's pretty evenly split between the robotics time and the uh, the materials. So the uh, the in vitro expression mix we use is one of the cheaper ones on the market, but it still costs uh, $500 for a milliliter and a half of E. coli extract. Uh, and the robotics time costs uh, about $500 per run, in which uh, each run is 12 sequences because each of these uh, agents gets to pick three sequences at a time. I didn't go into the batching strategy. Uh, the way that we uh, batch our sequences is when the model picks something, it assumes that its guess is correct and then folds it into the model and then picks something new. And so you get a different model choosing a sequence after each, uh, each round. We found in those uh, simulated experiments that you don't get a significant drop off in um, performance until you go above a batch, batch size of about five at once. Uh, anyway, that was a tangent just because I remembered something that I'd forgotten to talk about earlier. Um, so on the Stratio system, we get, uh, they charge by the plate rather than by the run or rather than by the protein. And so uh, they're able to run 12 sequences in parallel, which is why we did four agents doing uh, batches of three. So it costs us between reagents and the robot time about a thousand dollars per uh, per round. And second okay. part of Nathaniel's question uh, could explore more diverse sequence spaces if models could crosstalk. I almost suspect that the opposite would happen. I think that the the fact that we have these four independent agents means that they're learning different pathways to the top and in doing so learning different things about the non-top region of the space. So if you were to pool all of the data, then you're not really running four agents, you're really running one agent that does a batch of 12, which is not nearly as, um, as flexible. Now, there might be a way for them to share data, but sort of prioritize their own data. That might be something interesting to look into. It's just not something that we uh, tried with our robot time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give just a couple more uh, seconds for people to write any final questions they might have in the chat. Uh, I did want to ask a question, uh, Jacob, since you touched on in the beginning that mm -hmm. you've had a lot of different experiences in your career and um, protein engineering was something slightly newer and then more new to you was doing this automation. Um, I kind of just wanted to see if you had any advice for people in the audience who are in protein engineering or even more broadly like synthetic biology and how um, they can like pick up these sort of skills um, that kind of go into like the technicalities of setting up like um, an automated system. Uh, do you just kind of have any like words of advice for them uh, since you've now gone through this process from the ground up yourself? Yeah. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that, that I've seen is um, there are a bunch of different kinds of computational models that you could sort of focus your efforts on. All of them are going to be implemented in Python for the most part. So like, if, if you can learn a little Python, that's going to be a great first step. I didn't start learning Python until I started this project back in 2018. Um, but um, like, I didn't know a thing about working with robots, but I happened to, to get to work with one that had a nice API. Um, find the, the specific kinds of models that are maybe simpler to work with to start with. And it'll really help to, to get insights that you can then apply as you're learning more more relevant ones, I, th I think. Uh, like, I, I was doing really basic linear regression when I started out. And then I learned about Gaussian process regression. And that was the thing. That was the thing required for this project. 
I don't know if that's a, at all useful, Meg. Usually when no, I talk I about this sort of thing, it's it's to a group of people who don't do computer stuff at all. And we're in a machine learning for protein engineering group. <laughs> no, I think that's useful just because we have, uh, sometimes we tend to have younger students who are starting out who come to these. We've even had as young as high schoolers before, and they always tend to ask those type of questions. So I thought I would advocate and ask that sort of question today. Um, right on. So yeah. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat and I'm not seeing anyone who has unmuted or raised their hand. So I'll just give it a few more seconds before we uh, thank our speaker. But um, other than that, um, again, if you, oh, someone asked if you're looking for collaborators, Jacob. Uh, basically always, because uh, we just submitted the manuscript on this one and we want to get more, more projects ongoing. You know, you, you spend five years building a method and then the next paper is we did the method again, but with a different system. So absolutely looking for collaborators. Awesome. Well, we will have Jacob uh, introduced in the community Slack and you can um, definitely connect with him there if you don't already have his professional contact elsewhere from the website or anything like that. Um, other than that, just wanted to thank everybody again today for attending, and we hope to see you in two weeks for our next talk. Thank you so much.